my apologies, my camera battery died and I had to switch it out. Uh, I used it as an excuse for a costume change. Look, I look different now. I've got this, ooh, nice little cape. All right, anyway, we're reading the epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, we are on line 125. Let's commence. The hunter opened his mouth to speak, saying to his father, My father, there was a man came by the waterhole. Mightiest in the land, strength he possesses. His strength is as mighty as a rock from the sky. Over the hills he roams all day, always with the herd he grazes on grasses. Always his tracks are found by the waterhole. I am afraid and I dare not approach him. He fills the pits that I myself dig. He pulls up the snares that I lay. The hunter's trying to hunt the game, and Ankudu is like, no, those are my brothers. You cannot eat them. He sets free from my grasp all the beasts of the field. He stops me from doing the work of the wild. His father opened his mouth to speak, saying to the hunter, my son in the city of Uruk, go out! Seek Gilgamesh. In his presence, his strength is as mighty as a rock from the sky. <laughs> I love that phrase, and they just repeat it over and over and over again because they know it's a good one. His strength is as mighty as a rock from the sky. Take the road. Set your face towards a rook. Do not rely on the strength of a man. Go, my son, and fetch Shamhat, the harlot. Her allure is a match for even the mighty. When the herd comes down to the water hole, she should strip off her raiment and reveal her charms. He will see her and will approach her. His herd will spurn him, though his herd will spurn him, though he grew up amongst it. Paying heed to the advice of his father, the hunter went off, set out on a journey. He took the road, set his face towards a rook. Before Gilgamesh the king, he spoke these words. It's going to repeat now. I'm going to read it, but just a little aside about Shamhat the harlot. We'll get into this theme in the future, but just a little preamble of it here. You know, this is an interesting role for a woman to play, a prostitute to play, she's, you know, she's the one that's going to catch Ankudu. And on one level, there's this, like, incredible sexism to this, right? You know, beyond, beyond just gender binary, there's a clear, like, you know, she's, she's a harlot. <laughs> but, but it is a different kind of harlot than the harlot that we think of today, because she was divine. There were temple harlots, so she, Shamhat was a, a prostitute in the temple of Inanna, so she was a prostitute, but she was also a high priestess. So this is a, a role, a female role, that existed in the ancient past that we know of nothing remotely like it today. That someone who sells sex for a living could also be treated as the reincarnation of a goddess. So this is what we're talking about here. So when you, when you see sexist elements and elements that, that seem deeply patriarchal or even violent towards women, those are all there, right? I'm, I'm not going to apologize for them. But it's important to recognize that in addition to all of those elements being there, there was also this conception of woman and female sexuality as divine uh, and as deeply powerful in its own way. Uh, and, and that is something we have lost while maintaining the patriarchy, and uh, that makes the patriarchy much worse <laughs> in some ways. Anyway, I will talk about more. I will talk about that more later. Let me keep on reading. So, when the herd comes down to the water hole, she should rip off her raiment to reveal her charms. He will see her and will approach her. His herd will spurn him, though he grew up amongst it. Paying heed to the advice of his father, the hunter went off, set out on a journey. He took the road, set his face towards a rook. Before Gilgamesh the king, he spoke these words. There was a man came by the water hole, mightiest in the land, strength he possesses. His strength is as mighty as a rock from the sky. Over the hills he roams all day, always with the herd he grazes on grasses. Always his tracks are found by the water hole. I am afraid, and I dare not approach him. 
He fills the pits that I myself dig. He pulls up the snares that I lay. He sets free from my grasp all the beasts of the field. He stops me doing the work of the wild. I love the meter. I love the meter. It's so nice. Said Gilgamesh to him, to the hunter, Go, hunter, take with you Shamhat the harlot. When the herd comes down to the water hole, she should strip off her raiment and reveal her charms. He will see her and will approach her with his herd, and, and he will see her and will approach her, and his herd will spurn him, though he grew up amongst it. Isn't it interesting how Gilgamesh and the shepherd's father say exactly the same thing? word for word, even though they've never spoken to each other. It's very interesting, the narrative continuity of this piece. Characters kind of flow together. There isn't like a, a, you know, it's not like, it's just a different way of storytelling, but it's quite nice because I like repeating those things. Too many asides. Do you like the asides? Let me know. If, if you want me to keep on making commentary like this, then write that in the comments. And if you want me to just read it straight without blathermouthing so much, write that in the comments and then I will do either of those things that you say. Now I'm moving on. Said Gilgamesh to him, to the hunter, Go, hunter, take with you Shamhat the harlot. When the herd comes down to the water hole, she should strip off her raiment to reveal her charms. He will see her and will approach her. His herd will spurn him, though he grew up amongst it. Off went the hunter, taking Shamhat the harlot. They set off on the road. They started the journey. On the third day, they came to the destination. Hunter and harlot sat down there to wait. One day, a second, they waited. One day, a second, they waited by the water hole. Then the herd came down to drink the water. The game arrived, their hearts delighting in water, and Ankudu also, born in the uplands. So think about this. Shamhat and this hunter went off from a rook. They walked together for three days. <laughs> And then they got to this place in the forest, and then they waited there for two days. So they've been looking for this man for five days in the woods, right? I mean, and probably it was only like 10 miles away, but, but still, no, I guess 30 miles away. But it's like the, the, the relationship with land back then was just so different because you could walk for five days. That would be a regular thing. And yeah, and there's just a lot of space where you could find men living in the wild among the beasts. And you would be patient, too. You could have, like, two days just to, like, hang out by a water hall waiting for a man. A wild man that you're going to seduce and civilize. Moving on. One day, a second, they waited by the water hole. Then the herd came down to drink the water. The game arrived, their hearts delighting in water, and Ankudu also born in the uplands. With the gazelles, he grazed on grasses, joining the throng with the game at the water hole. His heart delighting with the beasts in the water. Then Shamhat saw him, the child of nature, the savage man from the myths of the wild. This is he, Shamhat. Uncradle your bosom. Bear your sex. Let him take you in your arms. Do not recoil, but take in his scent. He will see you and will approach you. Spread your clothing so he may lie on you. Do for the man the work of a woman. Let his passion caress and embrace you. His herd will spurn him, though he grew up amongst it. So she's going to seduce him, and he's going to become a civilized man. Shamhat unfastened the cloth of her loins. She bared her sex and took in her charms. She did not recoil. He took in, she took in his scent. She spread her clothing. He lay upon her. She did for the man the work of a woman. His passion caressed and embraced her. For six days and seven nights, Ankatu was erect. He coupled with Shamhat. For six days and seven nights, he had an erection. Ask your doctor. <laughs> um, so, so what do you think about this? You know, like it's it's a really strange uh, thing for you know to, to to have a story like this, and you know. Lines like, she did for the man the work of the woman, as if it's the woman's job to, to screw him, right? Like, but that's, you can, you can read this in a very negative way, but there's also something, like, kind of beautiful about it, you know? Like, if you, if you think about the gender roles abstractly, outside of their sociopolitical context for a moment, and you can think about, like, what the role of femininity is to being a human, 
right? You're like rather rather than what are the role of men and women in society, think about like what is the role of the female aspect of yourself in making you a human being. And when you think about it like that, when you interpret it like that, this starts to have a little bit more weight. You know, so the role of the woman in in you is is a kind of sensual side, a, a civilizing side. So both both sensual and civilizing, one that that you know transforms you into something more, right? So this transcend, tra transformative, domesticative aspect of femininity. It's a uh, it's something to ponder on. You know, it, it's it's a it's a way of thinking about what it means to be female that. Um, perhaps is different from the modern narratives that we have. Or, or maybe it's the same, you know? <laughs> That's the question. So tell me what you think about that. I, I'm really curious what you guys think about Shamhat, the holy prostitute. Uh, there'll be more of her later, but uh, this episode should end. So I'm going to keep on recording until I finish Tablet 1 and do Tablet 2 in a little bit. So next episode.